Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, an interesting tidbit is that we have attendees from 15 different states with us, so a big warm welcome to you all. We are truly honored to have you because we know how much your time is valued and limited, so we hope this will be a very beneficial session. My name is Kate Hernicek, and I'm delighted to be able to be your host today. I've spent the last 15 years in healthcare, where I've just developed a huge passion for best practices and providing exceptional patient care. Before we begin, there's just a few housekeeping items I want to go over with you. First of all, make sure your computer speakers are unmuted, although if you can hear me, you're on the right track, so that's great. Um, this is your time today, and we want to make sure that this is as interactive as possible. So as we are presenting, you can see at the, the bottom on the right-hand side of your screen, you have the questions. So submit your questions through that, and, um, and we'll get to them as, as we go through the presentation. Um, and just to let you guys all know, we're going to have a short three-minute video. Um, and sometimes, depending on how WebEx is working, the video goes smoothly, and sometimes it gets a little bit choppy. It's not you, it's actually WebEx. So just be patient, and um, we'll get through that video. But we'll also send you a link at the end that will give you information. So if you don't want to have to take a, a bunch of notes, then you, you won't miss out on the video because, again, we'll send you the link. Our agenda today will be to look at HCAPS, why we're all here, and then the history and the various methods that we know work to actually improve them. Yet, despite knowing what methods work, we have some challenges that prevent us from really truly implementing the tools and tactics. You're going to be hearing from two different presenters, both of them wonderful, a CNO who um, is, works for us at Banyan, and then also we have our guest speaker, Cami Diamond, who I will formally introduce here in a bit. She's going to share how her hospital, St. Anthony's, has improved their score and, and made a huge impact using this disruptive technology. As I mentioned, our first presenter, Linda Rittermeyer, is such a special lady to us here at Banyan. She's one of our internal clinical experts who helps to ensure that we are making an impact on healthcare where the pain points truly are. Linda began her nursing career at Children's Mercy Hospital, where she worked in both the OR and the NICU. And then we stole her away from her most current role as the CNO for an HCA hospital. You're in excellent hands with Linda, as she's had a great deal of experience with HCAPS, and she's going to take it from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am more than pleased to be able to talk to everybody about HCAP. Um, we all know that this is something that we live with each and every day. Um, when we hear of HCAPs now, um, we all think of uh, a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, HCAPs is here to stay. Uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Um, of course, the reason behind HCAPs um, is a, it gives us a measuring stick of how our patients perceive their care. But then we also think about value-based purchasing and reimbursement. And of course, all of this is very transparent. You know, anyone can Google anything these days, including your hospital and your HCAPS results. So what else do we know about HCAPS? So HCAPS came about in about 2002, um, CMS wanted to know about that measuring stick um, and how that perception of patient care worked. Um, in 2008, clinically, we became very aware as those results started getting, getting reported um, to our facilities. In 2012, the C-suite became acutely aware because it started really beginning with value-based purchasing. And as we know, there's always constant change moving to improve these outcomes. An example is our, the pain question. It's on hold right now, 
Um, but there will be more changes to come in the future. So what makes up these um, composites that we live with each and every day? Again, it's a perception of our patient's satisfaction with their care. Um, what all of these composites have to in common, if you look at them, key word is communication. Communication is at the core of everything. When I was a CNO um, in my various hospitals, I said communication was going to be, it could either make us successful or not. And good communication helps us develop a culture of always, which is what our goal is. A team approach is another thing. We all know what this means for nursing. Everybody knows how much nursing impacts all of these variety of composites. Even the physician, communication with the physician. But really at the end of the day, it is the total care team that impacts these, the patient satisfaction from beginning to end. And while we recognize that our nurses, we do need to find ways to help them. We have, we have tried many tools for improvement. I know I've tried quite a few of these. So that brings us to our poll question number one. We want to know from our audience, especially being such a diverse audience from 15 different states, um, what have you tried to improve your HCAP score? Up on your screen, you're going to be able to participate in our poll. We just want to know the tools and tactics that you've tried. Um, and so if you would just participate and give us your answer, we'll just take about 45 seconds. And um, most of you have tried all of the above. That seems to be about 100% of the answer. And then purposeful hourly rounding. And of course, we all know that hourly rounding can consist of nurse leader rounding as well as hourly rounding on the patient. We'll give you about 25 more seconds. Looks like 60% of you have voted, so we're just waiting on the other 40%. Okay, and so as you can see, most of you have all of the above, um, and Linda is going to kind of go further on these. So thank you for your participation. So as, as you've answered there, there's, there's a variety of things that we've tried. And like I said previously, as a CNO and a bedside nurse, I'm well aware of all the different things that we've tried in the past and, and how we've tried to make them work. You know, it came about um, a while back, um, and it's, we look at, looked at it as an assistance to help decrease our patient's anxiety. And how did we do that? ADIC's another tool for communication. We keep on coming back to that communication and teamwork. Um, I've implemented many of these improvements, as many of as you have. Um, and to what extent do they um, continue to work? I'm not able to say that for a fact that each or any one of these in and of itself helps change anything. But what we need to remember is all of our goal, and I'm sure you've said this to your peers or to your staff, every patient, every time. That's our key. And the consistency is the key for sustainable results, something that we all try to achieve. It cannot just be the new flavor of the month. I'm sure you've heard your staff, and I'm sure you've uttered those words too. What's this flavor this month? And that brings us to poll question number two. We all know what tools and tactics work, and it was very obvious in your answer to the first polling question that you've tried the tools and tactics. So now we want to understand from you what are the biggest challenges that you have with improving your HCAP scores? Um, you know, the not enough time in the day, and we see that in healthcare just prevail a ton. So we're going to watch for your answers, and we, again, greatly appreciate your participation so that we can understand you a little bit better. 
right now we're seeing a lot of resistance to change come in, and that's another big one. Our staff has to understand the why behind why do we need to change and, and be open to it. And we're going to give you about 10 more seconds. 55% of you have voted. So, oh, now 73. And resistance to change is still leading the pack. So as you can see, um, resistance to change followed closely by a shortage of patient care resources. And Linda, I'm, I know you're going to touch on these as well. Yes. So, you know, I've walked this walk. Um, I've talked this talk. Like I said, I've been a nurse for over 35 years. So we've all tried a variety of different things and what's going to work. So resistance to change, I'm going to touch on that one for just a minute. And it goes back to what I said just a little bit ago. A lot of our nurses know or have a feeling they perceive it's a flavor of the month. So if they work hard at the front end to help with this change, how long is it really going to stick around? What's the consistency of it? Sometimes we just wear our nurses out with the new thing that's coming down the street that we're going to try and hope it sticks. When my nurses come to work, I've seen them leave just totally frustrated. All they want to do is take care of their patients. I mean, that's why we all became nurses because we had something to give. We wanted to care for our patients. Kimmy's story is gonna be pretty amazing when she, when she starts talking about how uh, happy her nurses were, but it's that consistency and sustainability to help us scale it for success. And your nurses know it's gonna be the same today and tomorrow and the next day. Coming into work and knowing they're going to have this disruptive innovation, if that's what you want to call it, there, and it's not going to go anywhere. They don't want to go around the same block again and again, just like we don't. So how do we make this easier? What is this Banyan's disruptive innovation? Our short video will give you an idea of what this intelligent innovation is. With our Aura solution, we have a technology with the change management process that can have an immediate impact on your HCAP scores. So sit back and watch the video, please. Again, I'm just going to touch on the technical difficulties. So it's not your computer. Don't shut it off. It's just about a two and a half minute video. So hopefully it comes through. But just bear with us if it doesn't, because sometimes our WebEx is a little bit um, uh, wonky, if you will. At Banyan, patient care is at the heart of everything we create. Introducing Banyan Care. Banyan Care is designed to make the patient experience more positive while empowering nurses to truly deliver the best bedside care possible. This system is revolutionary. It enables healthcare professionals to interact with patients and access their information in real time from anywhere. Here's how it works. The heart of Banyan Care exists right where care is delivered, the patient room. The system integrates technology to the TV in a typical patient's room. We add a touchscreen computer, communication camera, fall prevention camera, speaker, and a microphone. Hi, Mr. Avery, this is Anna, and I'll be helping with your care today. The touch screen is placed below the TV, and the TV itself is used as a secondary monitor for sharing content. You have the ability to bring all the content and systems that you already utilize together in this one screen. Electronic medical records, images and diagrams, notes, and other content. Patients and their family members can simply tap the screen to have instant access to their nurse. Providers in the room can use it to perform rounds, mentoring, or simply communicate with a nurse. Nursing staff is notified as to who is calling in, so they can prioritize accordingly and enhance workflow. When a patient or family member taps the screen, it defaults to audio only, so the provider can make sure it's an appropriate time to use the camera. Now, the nurse can pan 
tilt and zoom the camera to check on different visual aspects of the patient room. They can pull up documents or images, make notes and visual references for patient education. From one screen, providers have access to all medical information necessary to make rounds, conduct admissions, discharges, and deliver patient education. Multiple providers can even join in simultaneously and interact with the Banyan application remotely. When it comes to patient education and communication, our tools enable healthcare professionals to interact with patient information in a whole new way. For example, drawing right on the screen to highlight things of importance. Banyan Care transforms patient satisfaction by allowing hyper-communication and collaboration between nurses, hospitalists, pharmacists, doctors, and families right in the patient's room where patient care is delivered. We are Banyan, and we believe in healthcare transform. Like. So, hopefully that was helpful. Um, so here on, um, I'm just going to speak very shortly about um, what you saw in in the video. So Banyan's Aura Solution, of course, transform how how healthcare is delivered at the bedside. Your patient's room can be equipped with an intelligent monitor system, which you saw in the video. And this monitor enables your patient care team to access that critical communication they need to communicate with your patients and their families on a consistent basis, or allows that hyper communication, if you will, um, with the virtual nurse 24-7, 365. The virtual nurse, your bedside nurse, and your care team are all able to deliver exceptional, consistent, and sustainable care. As Kim will share how St. Anthony's, is, who is part of CHI, were able to achieve these amazing results through this consistency and sustainability. The outcome, the benefits for Aura, Again, Cammie's experience will uh, experience with these results as she tells her story. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kate, who will be introducing our amazing keynote speaker. Thank you, Linda. We are so thrilled to have Cami Diamond, a current Banyan partner here with us today, to share her own experiences with Aura, the Banyan Disruptive Technology and Workflow Solution. Cami is currently working as a clinical nurse manager at St. Anthony's Hospital in Lake St. Anthony's is a part of Centura and CHI Health and is located just outside of Denver. She is a passionate leader, having attended the Colorado Center for Nursing Excellence and Advanced Leadership Development Program, and also participating on many committees for continuous improvement. Cami has been such a wonderful partner to us at Banyan, continuously providing us feedback and great learning from her. She shares her story today out of her own passion for helping others achieve the same results in their own hospitals and because of she's very passionate about what she's been able to ac accomplish she's not being compensated for her time today and we are so grateful for her Tammy take it away hello everyone uh, thank you for uh, attending today and it's my pleasure to speak about my experience um, in my hospital I'm very proud of our accomplishments here uh, St. Anthony Hospital is located in Lakewood, Colorado. We are a level one trauma center um, and uh, located at the base of the mountains. We are very much a critical care hospital, uh, level one trauma center. We get most of the traumas um, from the mountains um, and the ski areas. We are also a certified stroke center and um, cardiac uh, interventions as well. We're uh, highly rated. so. Uh, we are also the home of Flight for Life. We were the first Flight for Life uh, program in the country 
back in the 70s. So St. Anthony is, uh, has a proud history, about 125 years now. Uh, seventh floor, the innovation unit. Um, so we had an opportunity to uh, build out our seventh floor, um, create a brand new unit. Now we needed uh, more med medical surgical beds, acute care beds. Um, so we decided to build out another 36 acute care bed unit. Now we had challenges though, and, and we all do. We were having trouble in the Denver metro area filling our nurse positions. We, and this, you know, is multifaceted nursing shortages. Our um, schools can't seem to get our nurses out into the field fast enough. Um, and uh, uniquely in the Denver metro area, we are saturated market. You do not have to have a, certi a certification of need to build a hospital. So we have actually quite a few uh, clustered together in uh, the Denver metro area. So nurses have a lot of options for where they want to work. So our nursing force workforce is spread very thin. Um, with that said, we get our inexperienced nurses, um, you know, whether they're on night shift or day shift, they're uh, brand new to the field for the most part um, with very little oversight. They're sort of thrown in, thrown to the fire. <laughs> um, and so we had that, that issue going on. Um, we With reimbursement challenges, and we all know those as well, we talked about it earlier, um, you're, you're really being held to a high level of quality and uh, standards that are really high, but of course we get back to we don't have enough nurses. So how do you provide quality patient care without nurses? Well, um, what we decided to do was take a look at team-based care, which is not a new concept by any means. Um, some people may remember uh, team-based care from uh, you know earlier than maybe the 80s. Um, so what we decided though within that uh, within that team model, we needed to change some things up. We do in the Denver metro area, we do not have enough LPNs. And really what their LPNs do, and, the, and we're looking at nurse extenders in this scenario, what what can we find that is close to an LPN, um, but we're hoping for maybe a little bit more acute um, knowledge. So our immediate response, since we are the home of Flight for Life um, was the paramedic. So uh, since we're a critical care hospital, we have our own paramedic school um, from St. Anthony's and we work with paramedics often with our Flight for Life team. This was something that we decided to look at. Paramedics are abundant um, in the Denver metro area. And luckily for us, they make um, exceptional nurse extenders. Um, if they are wanting to be nurses themselves, they make uh, even better choices because they are on a career path. So they want to learn how to become a nurse. So what we did was actually provide that uh, career path for them. We're providing scholarships for the Paramedic to RN Bridge program. We partnered with a Kansas school who actually has this program in place already. And our foundation for our hospital is providing scholarships for our paramedics to attend nursing school um, and to become associate degree nurse within a year. So with that, um, we were able to attract quite a few. And I every time I open these job requisitions on our website, I get more than enough applicants. So we are finding these critical care, um, very experienced paramedics, extremely interested in becoming nurses, just flooding um, my cue and you know we're deciding that we can provide a team approach with the paramedics um, and still maintain a high quality so if you could go to the next slide for me what we had was what we call a green field we the floor was brand new built out I recruited nurses paramedics CNAs unit clerks, all of those people, knowing them knowing that we were going to do something very disruptive, very different. Um, and 
outside the norm of the rest of the hospital, honestly. So um, we did so for this 36 bed medical surgical unit. We are, you know, your general medical surgical, but we do have an emphasis on sepsis up here. So we do have a lot of sepsis alerts, a lot of infection, a lot of wound care. Um, so an antibiotic administration. So we decided to have, uh, we split our 36 bed unit into nine patient pods. And so they work in a, a team taking care of nine patients. We have a bedside nurse, a paramedic and a CNA partnered together for those nine patients and it's geographically assigned as well. This is sort of a mimicking of our ER. The, our ER actually functions in this way as well. And um, the partnership between the paramedic and the nurse is much like our flight crew. So we had uh, trainings with our flight crew and our ER as well before we opened. But they work in a pod, so we have four different pods on the unit when we're full. Um, we have a charge nurse as well on the unit as a resource. And of course, layered on top of this crew at bedside is our virtual nursing um, initiative. So we uh, partnered with Banyan and uh, put together the role of the virtual nurse in this team environment. Um, next slide, please. So you can see our um, diagram here. We have a hospitalist who is actually uh, the medical director for our paramedic group. Um, they uh, dictate their clinical practice. So the bedside nurse and the paramedic are not delegating between each other. They're actually collaborating. Um, they're working in parallel. Most people um, have trouble thinking about this. I mean, as a, as a nurse, it's very hard to think about another care team member taking over care for the patients, especially medication paths, wound care, traditionally nurse-centric uh, interventions. The paramedic, though, I often say to my nurses, well, you know, your respiratory therapist gives all of your respiratory treatments. Are they any different? And the answer, of course, is no. They're not on the nurse's license, but they are still providing care. So that's the same with the paramedic. So we we came up with the bedside crew and the virtual nurse, who is really a source of information for our hospitalist group, our, our physicians. Um, they coordinate plans of care. They have that larger view. They're, we have uh, two for a 36 bed unit, so they take care of 18 patients. And their job really is to um, drive the plan of care, make sure things are happening in a timely manner, uh, make sure we're hitting our quality uh, and core measures. They do live chart audit. Um, and they really are, they, att they attend multidisciplinary rounds at bedside. And they're really integral to um, basically maintaining and, and driving um, the entire length of stay for the patient. Um, so they coordinate quite a bit. They're leaders on our floor. They do patient rounding as well. Um, and so they're all experienced nurses who can really have that in-depth knowledge. They work closely with case management and social work to also uh, help with discharging um, complex care rounds, et, et cetera, for some of our more challenging patients. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So given this team environment, we started um, really in March 2017. And you kind of see the beginning of this um, flow here. We um, we started uh, in a traditional model, and then that was, you know, that matched with um, our other acute care floors was kind of our baseline. As we implemented, we saw an, a pretty intense shift in our patient experience scores. Um, now, were they perfect? Clearly not. But the trend was decidedly up over time. Um, and so this is through January, but you can see um, the substantial increase the, in percentage points um, over time, some of which are even 100% scores. So it was really kind of interesting to see this, this progression as we went. 
Um, and at first, you know, we had definitely had glitches um, and and challenges uh, that we had to go through. But overall, uh, we had a really great, we've had a really great response from our patients. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so, I, as I had mentioned, um, we have uh, the virtual nurse doing a lot of our patient rounding, and I know that um, managers and leaders have a lot of uh, challenges related to actually completing nurse leader rounding. One of those questions is, did a nurse leader visit you during your stay? Well, most of the time the managers have so many meetings and um, flyers to put out. This is really challenging for them to get to every patient. Um, team leads are helping, assistant nurse managers, supervisors, etc. cetera, um, but uh, the, that's pretty inconsistent as well. So it was nice to be able to have someone who we script um, to round on patients. And you could see they started uh, in April, and suddenly our scores started to go up. I've never seen four months in a row of 100%, um, nor really in the 90s, <laughs> at least at our hospital. So we actually had staffing challenges um, in the January, February timeframe, and, and they went through about March, beginning of April. And you can see when we took that virtual nurse out of there, our scores dropped immediately. Um, and we did that. We took our virtual nurses and put them out in the charge role because of staffing challenges housewide. And so we actually saw immediately what happens whenever your virtual nurse is not uh, rounding on patients. And so, again, sort of a success and failure. So, so celebrate your failures. Um, really, really interesting stuff to see. Um, next slide, please. So we, again, we're just sort of comparing um, quality metrics. Um, we also looked at call light response time because we, you know, one of the questions is responsiveness of staff. Um, of course, we still, to this day, do not have any CAUTI or central line infections. Uh, our fall rate is below goal and um, really decreased quite a bit. Uh, that's one of our big challenges at this hospital in general. Um, and of course, our length of stay and readmission rates were um, drastically different in this model. And I will, I will say, part of this is because we've decreased cost of care with nurse extenders, and um, we, we require less nurses because of it. But um, at the same time, there are more people taking care of the patients. So that's really an interesting fact here. You have your virtual nurse, your charge nurse, your bedside nurse, your paramedic, and your CNA all taking care of these patients um, versus our traditional model where you have a charge nurse who has to help everyone on the floor, a bedside nurse, and a CNA. So we're really shooting ourselves in the foot, in my opinion, saying the nurse has to do everything. But really what we're trying to do is have our nurse work at the top of their license. They're the leader of this team. The virtual nurse is their expert, um, and they really have a lot of support. So we actually have new grads in this model who also are flourishing because they have an experienced paramedic standing next to them during a rapid, and they have a virtual nurse speaking to them over the, over the screen telling them, you know, make sure you assess this, let me chart that, um, so it's really a, a nice support system. Next slide, please. So more comparisons. The orange here is our overall hospital um, numbers uh, for fiscal year to date. To I think it was through January still, um, and we were uh, below. Everything that everyone else in the hospital is doing, we are doing uh, clearly zero, zero. You can see some of those serious safety events, none. Um, so it was really pretty harrowing, um, and our, our staff are very proud of these results. Next slide, please. So 
um, <laughs> this was definitely not an easy change. We we went through a lot of feedback and ups and downs, and our our physicians had to be brought um, into the fold of all of this. But overall, these were you know some of the patients giving us some of these. Um, responses, their own words, and um, we we feel that we were, were extremely proud of what um, we did, and it was not easy. It still isn't easy to this day. We still have, um, you know, misunderstanding and pushback and all sorts of things, but overall, we let just, like, our numbers speak for what we're doing and our patients' words. So, um, yeah, this concludes my portion um, and I will be available for questions here in a moment. Thank you so much, Cami, for sharing your story. Um, while we're waiting for your questions to come in, and I appreciate all, all of you who have submitted those so far, just a little bit about Banyan. Um, we are in 36% of the top health systems across the United States. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, and a lot of times when we get to this point, people are saying, you know, what, what does this cost? You know, there's that elephant in the room. And I know that we've given you a lot to think about today, but um, I also want to let you know that um, we work with hospitals like yours across the country to determine a forecast of the benefits and costs of implementing this innovative solution. And our partners have truly found that with the savings you incur, compared to the investment in the technology is quite enormous. As you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, this, is, this example is taken from a current partner of ours with a 67-bed med surge unit. And with their savings from overtime, turnover, and quality outcome improvements, they are expected to save almost $6 million over a five-year time period. And again, this is this is including the technology. So we've subtracted what what the technology portion of this has costed, and they're still going to see a huge return on their investment. So, and in the number one section, we would we would just really love to continue this conversation with you, um, while also trying to bring you some tremendous value. We're going to be sending you a link after after the meeting today. And we're going to ask for information um, such as your current costs, quality metrics, and scores. And if you take time to fill this out and send it back to us, as a complimentary service to you, we calculate the benefits to see what you, with your own personal numbers, um, could realize over, the, over five years. And there's no strings attached and your information is, is kept confidential. But it's a great look and glimpse for you at, at what technology um, can bring to your organization. And if you do this, we send you back about a six-page document that's nice and colorful. Um, it looks a little bit like what you see on your screen here, and, and it gives you an idea um, of exactly what you can save, and you can take this to your executive team or to your, your nurse leaders, and, and it, can, um, it can really add to the conversation. So, um, as I close up the, se the information session and we begin the, the, the question and answer section, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of myself, Linda and Cami, and also Banyan Medical Systems for joining us today. We know your time is valuable. If you want to continue discussions, have questions, you can reach out to myself or Linda. And again, we're going to send you our contact information and, um, and other links that will be helpful to you. Um, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, as you can see, we have a few events coming up. Um, our first event, which is happening in a few weeks, is our fall prevention webinar. We've had hundreds attend this, and we've received great feedback. The fall prevention is just a, a smaller portion of technology in the patient room, and, um, and it's working excellent. Um, and then Banyan is also co-hosting a healthcare innovation summit alongside the advisory board in Baltimore, Maryland in October, um, and we, ha we have the pleasure of hearing Carol Boston Fleischauer um, share with us all about disruptive innovation and what it can do for you. So we hope you'll consider joining us for one of these events. So Cami, we have some questions that have come in here, and um, the first one is, what was St. Anthony's ratio before this system, and what is it now? Yeah. 
so our ratio uh, currently on the other floors, acute care floors, and before we started this uh, this project, uh, typically, you know, day shift will have five patients to a nurse, um, and night shift would have around six. Um, did that get stretched on occasion? Uh, yes, which um, not our ideal. Um, and to this day, we'll say our, our our ideal day shift ratio is four one to four, um, and night shift one to five. Um, but like I said, more normally it would be five on day shift and six on night. Um, as of right now, um, we you know on the seventh floor we don't talk about the ratio game because really um, it doesn't make sense to say the nurse ratio um, because they're working in a team environment. I mean. Basically, we've got a team of five to nine, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, we've got nine patient pods and a virtual nurse, a charge nurse, a bedside nurse, a paramedic, and a CNA all taking care of those nine patients. So it's a, it's a not necessarily a ratio, but um, a team taking care of them. And then a, a question that we've seen come in from a couple different people. Um, are the patients put off by a nurse coming on on the TV? And are, are you recording the patient? Does the patient ever refuse? Uh, no recording takes place. Um, it is much like a, any other fall monitoring, you know, TV monitoring program. You just, there is no recording. Um, are they put off? You know, I actually haven't had that many uh, patients who are opposed to the virtual nurse. Um, I do. I have had some patients with mental health issues. Um, a lot of the paranoid schizophrenic type people. I've had a couple of those who have refused to speak to the virtual nurse. Of course, the beauty of the virtual nurse role, though, is that they continue what they need to do for the patient and their plan of care behind the scenes. They may not necessarily go into the room virtually, um, but they're still there functioning, um, speaking with the care team, doing that live chart audit. So even though they're not in the room virtually, they're there. Um, and then question number three, how does the patient and the family call the virtual nurse? So there are touchscreen, um, touchscreen computer basically in, in the room below the television that uh, patients or family can uh, just touch the button to call a nurse. It'll go directly to the virtual nurse, but also uh, they can hit their regular call light button and ask for their virtual nurse, which we, occasionally they do that as well. And then um, Lyndon, Linda, can a question for you? Um, do you get pushback from the physicians um, over the virtual nurses? Um, and then, how do doctors use the Banyan system to talk to patients? So I have not had um, any of our current partners say that there's been pushback from any physician. Um, in fact, I think Cammie's got a pretty good story about one of their physicians um, and his um, change of hurt, if you will, on the virtual nurse. But um, just to kind of continue, our physicians really like to have that nurse in the, in the virtual nurse come around with him. I know we all like to have our nurses rounding with our physicians, but sometimes they're drawn someplace else. Um, so for that virtual nurse to be able to learn the physician's likes and dislikes, they usually already have stuff up in the patient's room. So when the physician comes in, they can have that uh, conversation. And then as Cami pointed out, they're really quarterbacking um, that team. And that includes the physician too. So they're in communication with the physician um, and the nurses to make sure that communication and consistency is, is always taken care of. So, so far, um, we really haven't had any physicians. Some of them have had to have their hearts changed um, but they really, really like what they're doing now. Cami, don't you have an orthopedist or something that really kind of changed his mind? 
actually it was one of our urologists um <laughs> so he uh i mean he had pre preconceived notions about it didn't feel like it was really necessary for his um workflow um, but we had our virtual nurse, he comes in pretty early, we had our virtual nurses sort of pop into the room whenever he arrived and asked, you know, would you, you know, would you like me to put in those orders for you? Let me bring up the latest labs on the screen for you. And, um, you know, suddenly um, he decided he didn't want his patients to go to any other floor. Um, so now we have, although usually they would be kind of spread out throughout the hospital. Now it's uh, Dr. Zukowski is basically our physician. So we've been uh, pretty much specialized to his uh, robotic prostatectomy patients and things like that. So it's been nice to have his uh, backing and support since he first tried it early on. Okay, one last question for you, Cami, um, and Linda, you can chime in as well, but um, are there any safety or regulatory concerns by having a virtual nurse? Um, safety or regulatory concerns? Uh, you know, I mean, we try to uh, maintain the patient privacy uh, at all times, and I think that's probably the only real regulatory type thing that we would try to uh, maintain and the virtual nurses are trained very extensively on just maintaining HIPAA um, and privacy for that patient. So they're trained to ask in advance um, over the speaker if they can enter the room um, virtually and they uh, maintain privacy at all times. And then of course, making sure they have the patient the correct patient record and things like that to display on the screen but other than that i don't i don't see any other regulatory issues and then um one more just came in cami what are the virtual nurse certification requirements or the job description that you have for the virtual nurse um so we decided that we uh wanted to stay relatively open to this we wanted uh, at first, we wanted the um, virtual nurse to have at least five years of experience, have leadership or education um, backgrounds or case management even, um, just have that something where plan of care and that bigger scope. Um, so we didn't actually require them to have any certifications or um, the only thing I think we required was uh, ACLS uh, so that they could help uh, verbally run a code or a uh, rapid response, which they do um, do over virtual technology. Um, so we only thing we required really was that those years of experience, um, that background and ACLS. Now, um, most of them have a lot of other kinds of experience as well. Um, and I know that some of the CHI hospitals are requiring, you know, CNS or CNL um, leadership type um, degrees, master's degrees. We felt that your that was pretty limiting for us. Not many of our nurses have that sort of um, background, and those are pretty hard to find. So we ended up actually reducing the numbers number of years of experience because we had um, some nurses who were uh, we trained as relief virtual nurses, and they were only three years of experience or so but they really were very good at the technology and they had that level of expertise that we were looking for clinically as well. So we just sort of decided that we were being a little bit, a little too picky even with what we had originally decided. So um, three years of experience is now what we look for um, and some of that leadership and um, bigger picture type uh, expertise. So that's what we require. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Cami, for your time today. And thank you um, also to Linda. Uh, if you guys have any more questions or we didn't get to something that you wanted to be um, to talk about today, please feel free to reach out to Linda or myself. Um, our emails will be in your follow-up email that you'll receive from us. Um, again, we would love to, to further the discussion or, or help you with a cost analysis as well. So, um, we'll give you back 10 minutes in your day, and we truly appreciate you joining us.